We were just asking the question about Lyndon Johnson, and you said your favorite story about Lyndon Johnson was... Well, uh, there's a reporter on the New York Times, uh, I'm not sure if he's still active, he's named Russell Baker, who wrote a book called Growing Up. Anyway, he was a top-notch reporter and columnist on the New York Times, and uh, uh, when Lyndon Johnson, before he became president, was majority leader of the U.S. Senate, uh, Baker told me that one day when he was walking past Senator Johnson's office, by the long arm of Lyndon reached out and pulled him into the office and sat him down and said to him, uh, you know, you're the best damn reporter on Capitol Hill. I want to explain to you why you're the best, because you, when you write your stories, you always take into consideration the personality of the people that you're writing about, which uh, Senator Johnson said, that's so important, so different from other reporters. And he went on for about 15 minutes uh, praising uh, him. And so Baker then said, uh, at one point, uh, uh, Senator Johnson pushed the buzzer for his secretary to come in and scratched a little note to his secretary, and she scratched a little answer. And Baker said, when I left his office, I went by the secretary's desk. She was on break and read the note where Johnson had written to his secretary, can you tell me the name of uh, who the hell this guy is I've been talking with? And uh, it was a beautiful example of the Johnson treatment of trying to flatter people that might be able to write better stories about him. Well, it's, it's great. I thought that was a good description of uh, Johnson's personality. 1950, you, you got to the White House in your role in 1949. As I recall, and so and during 50, 1950, Elger Hiss, McCarthy, communism, blacklists. Uh, what was that time like for you in the White House? And what was, how much did Truman was he paying attention to that? Well, of course, uh, Truman was the kind of president who made it clear not only to everybody, but also we on the staff recognized that uh, he was really the boss and not a person who was, although he did insist that every member of the staff be a not a yes man and always raise our voice when we thought something different should be uh, done. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, he really believed, and the buck stops here, that he was the person to make the decisions. And uh, secondly, he had a, another sign on his desk that what most people never realized. It was a quotation from Mark Twain, always do right, this will gratify most of the people and astonish the rest. Uh, and he, uh, as I have frequently said, had a moral compass, which was an addiction to justice, and uh, not what public opinion uh, might say. And this is why uh, he never let anybody take a poll, because he said, polls do not give you a definition of justice. Did you get a, what was Truman's personal feelings towards Joe McCarthy? Did he ever talk about that? His personal? His personal feelings. Did he ever say, Ken, this guy is fill in the blank? Well, uh, 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 he always made it clear that uh, he did not 
Uh, he resented uh, columnists that were trying to uh, imagine things that never really happened. And uh, of course, he uh, became outraged when anybody criticized Margaret as he did with the uh, famous concert that uh, where Paul Hume had written a nasty review of Margaret singing. Uh, Truman was a very proud father who uh, uh, resented anything that was said negatively either about his wife or his daughter. Very strong family man and uh, I noticed uh, even when we were down at Key West that at 7 p.m. every evening if uh, either Bess or Margaret were away, he always put in a phone call to them at 7 p.m. every evening and he revered uh, his family even though when his mother went to visit him in the White House, I, she was an unreconstructed rebel because of the fact that when she was 11 years old, the Union Army had burned all the buildings and livestock on their farm and put 11-year-old uh, uh, Mrs. Truman in the in a concentration camp and uh, so she would not sleep in the Lincoln bedroom when she visited her son in the White House. So uh, he had very uh, pronounced feelings about generals. Uh, he revered Generals like Pershing, under whom he served in World War I, or Robert E. Lee, or uh, Omar Bradley, or people who, uh, as he said, didn't have to put on a show in order to get attention. And he particularly resented uh, uh Yeah, hold on a second. Yes? No. No. Who are you? No, I, I have not heard from uh, the... Uh, no. You know where he, where, where he is? Can't, don't you have another driver? Well, I just want to be sure that without question that this document uh, go on overnight mail. All right. Yeah, sure. I'll definitely be here, but uh, I hope you, you or somebody could call when you get here because I want to be sure that I'm outside and available. Thank you. That was FedEx. And Do they require a signature? He's got a security number. Uh, no, well, he just, no, they don't. He's got a mail. Uh, so I'm going to have probably have you be his personal secretary to make sure this happens. Um, what did she say? She just wanted to be sure of the timing of this. No, we, no, well, just so uh, it gets into overnight mail, that's right. all. Yeah. 
we'll, so, make, we'll make sure that happens here. So they say it may be 3.30 or 4 p.m. before they get here. Okay. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let him take a rest now so that he's... Yeah, we're, we're gonna... Around. You wanna continue or... Why don't we take a break right now and maybe we can take a quick nap before these guys get here. It's, we'll have it all set. So, between all of us, we'll make sure that these guys, once he gets here, we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. So we're all done. Oh, yeah. Sure. It's all good. Good timing. Could uh, take my questions in English and immediately translate them into German questions and then to take the German answers and immediately uh, translate them back into English and take English shorthand. And the English shorthand was not, I mean, usually people who translate from German into English put the verb at the end of the sentence and things like that. But um, I wanted you to be aware as, as we were talking out on the porch of the things I forgot to tell you about 1940. Yeah, why don't you do it for the camera here? All right. You were talking about 1940, a little bit about what was happening in your life. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was teaching at uh, Columbia University that time, uh, that time uh, and uh, <clears throat> I saw a notice for a civil service examination called an examination for a junior professional assistant at 1440 a year and I thought it would be a wonderful thing during the summer of 1940 to uh, take that exam and spend the summer at my first federal job and so uh, I took the exam and I uh, got a pretty high mark on it and so I got a letter from the director of the uh, uh, Census Bureau uh, saying to report to the Census Bureau office at 2nd and D Street, Southwest Washington, D.C. and to uh, take an examination to uh, show that I was in good health, uh, which I was able to submit in writing. And uh, so, uh, I was uh, immediately assigned to uh, a very large uh, auditorium about as big as a basketball court where literally thousands of clerks were hired to uh, go over the initial uh, census reports to ensure that the addition was accurate to ensure that there were no glitches in those reports mm -hmm. and uh, this was a uh, it was a fairly routine job but uh, we uh, had to fly spec all of these reports from the field to ensure of their accuracy and uh, as a politician I started out by interviewing and getting to know each of the 30 members of my uh, clerical section and uh, as a person with a lot of ambition, I uh, was able to, uh, first of all, to uh, work very hard in terms of uh, processing the reviews that I was doing and got a reputation for b being the, the speediest and most accurate uh, uh, reviewer which led to my promotion to from a clerk to assistant section chief at 1620 
a year instead of 1440. And then just before I had to return to Columbia in September to teach, as was my obligation, I got another promotion to be section chief, and uh, I tried to organize my uh, <coughs> section unit into a uh, razzle-dazzle group that uh, <coughs> put on performances like we had a, a section cheer that uh, yeah. uh, rocked the whole uh, area and uh, I got to be so popular with my uh, <coughs> section that they they had a farewell party for me which they wrote a poem uh, which started out uh, poems of parting should be sad and filled with mush and goo. Somehow those words, however, do not apply to you. And then they went on in several verses to uh, <coughs> say that the <coughs> in September the loss to the Census Bureau will be Columbia's gain and uh, hoping that I'd be successful in my teaching and that I get that I get apples every day from my students, yeah. and it uh, it was a uh, really a, a joyful experience because uh, you know <clears throat> when you're teaching. You really work 80 hours a week to keep ahead of your students, particularly if you're a young professor, and uh, you have to <clears throat> take the initiative on everything you do. But then in a federal job, uh, everything is provided for you. You, you can relax and, and concentrate on the uh, job without having to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. And I found that very refreshing that, uh, and actually relaxing. So I'm glad I went through that experience in 1940 because the uh, members of my section, after I went back to Columbia, wrote me some nice letters uh, and we were, they regarded us, me as a good friend of everybody, personal friend, sure. which is uh, obviously what a politician is happy about. Switching gears, moving ahead a little bit, now yes. we're Truman, you're in the uh, White House. Uh, you have a section in your book on Douglas MacArthur. And yes. You say the constitutional issue of civilian control over the military, MacArthur's repeated refusal to obey orders not to release foreign policy statements, his public insistence on the superior wisdom of using nationalist Chinese troops, Chinese troops on Formosa to join in attacking the Chinese mainland, his belligerent March 24th, 1951 message that torpedoed the president's delicate efforts to negotiate a ceasefire in Korea, all were factors which contributed to MacArthur's recall. You were there during that time period. Yes. What was going on? What, what well, that? actually, uh, <coughs> Truman, as I think I indicated on an earlier tape, had a distinct preference for generals that did not have to put on a show uh, in order to, to attract attention and, and uh, get accolades from Truman, he favored people like uh, Robert E. Lee and uh, uh, General Pershing, Omar Bradley, people like that. And uh, also, uh, 
Truman kept a diary, which we do not discover until after his death, and in that diary he has an interesting comment on General MacArthur even before he fired him. It starts out with Truman's uh, recollecting a poem about the city of Boston that goes, here's to the city of Boston, the land of beans and cod, where the Lowell's speak only to the Cabots, and the Cabots speak only to God. And underneath that, Truman had written, at least the Lowell's and the Cabots talked to each other before they talked to God, but MacArthur tells God right off. <laughs> the uh, uh, Truman, who is a uh, paragon of uh, humility, probably the the most humble occupant of the White House since Thomas Jefferson uh, just resented the uh, self-serving arrogance of uh, MacArthur. And uh, MacArthur himself uh, was always encouraged by the fact that uh, whenever he had an argument with Franklin Roosevelt by uh, Roosevelt was really scared of MacArthur and his popularity, and uh, MacArthur always won. And MacArthur got the idea that uh, he could uh, outguess any president, that he had a superior knowledge uh, of how to uh, avoid getting ordered to, to do anything by the president. And Roosevelt himself, uh, there are two public officials that uh, Roosevelt was really afraid of. One was MacArthur and the other was J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, and uh, Truman was never afraid of either one. <laughs> what triggered the decision finally? I mean, at some point, all this, everything's simmering to the surface. Uh, was there a one little tipping point that said, aha, that's it, I gotta do it. I think the, uh, that uh, ultimate tipping point was uh, at a time when, uh, despite MacArthur's very brilliant decision to uh, land behind the uh, North Korean lines at Incheon in September, uh, why, uh, after that, why the American and South Korean forces were pushed southward uh, to such an extent that uh, <clears throat> Truman felt that finally the status quo ante, meaning uh, uh, <clears throat> establishing a line at the 38th parallel where it had been June 25th, 1950, when the North Koreans first stormed against the south of the 38th parallel. If that line could be restored to what it was, that's what I mean by the status quo ante, A-N-T-E, that uh, that would be a, a, a great way to uh, pull out of a Korea and have a ceasefire and uh, and not to uh, fight any further because Korea, sort of like Vietnam, was a very unpopular war uh, because it was a stalemate uh, at this point. And what really disturbed Truman was the fact that while he was trying to negotiate this ceasefire, why, that's when on the 24th of March, it, MacArthur made that belligerent statement that he was going to uh, not only uh, win uh, the war for South Korea, but uh, actually uh, go north of the Yalu River and uh, conquer communist China. And uh, uh, so uh, what Truman wanted was a uh, ceasefire and withdrawal, which 
caused MacArthur to make the statement, there's no substitute for victory, and a stalemate is, is not victory. And that was a very appealing publicity statement that appealed to the American people because the American people believed if you go to war, you go to war to win, not to create a stalemate. Wasn't also one of the triggers, uh, House Republican leader Joseph Martin read a message from MacArthur. Oh yes, that's, that's very true that uh, Truman was very affected by the politicizing of the uh, MacArthur approach that uh, <clears throat> that actually was initiated by former Republican speaker and uh, at that time uh, Republican leader of the uh, House of Representatives, Joseph W. Martin Jr. of Massachusetts, that uh, for political reasons asked General MacArthur for his opinion on how to win in Korea. And uh, uh, <clears throat> MacArthur, without consulting uh, any uh, body in, in Truman's entourage, uh, wrote this letter back to Martin, which put the whole issue in, in partisan terms when Martin read MacArthur's letter on the floor of the House of Representatives and uh, the, this was a piece of rank insubordination because MacArthur had been ordered to clear all of his public statements uh, with the White House before they were made public and he did this independent of uh, that order, and uh, it politicized the whole issue and uh, made it obvious that MacArthur was more interested in uh, creating political gain out of the whole situation, because MacArthur clearly had political ambitions, and this is what caused uh, Truman to ask me to prepare a memorandum on the relations between President Lincoln and General George McClellan at the time of the Civil War when uh, McClellan, like MacArthur, had a very dim view of the President of the United States at that time. Uh, thought that he was a person that had superior military knowledge and did not, neither McClellan nor MacArthur uh, felt that the President Lincoln and President Truman uh, had any military knowledge whatsoever. Did you know there was conversation and discussion going on about the potential of firing of MacArthur? Was that a buzz that was going on within the White House before it was announced? Uh, we, of course, all knew about the orders that uh, uh, President Truman had given to uh, remove uh, uh, the uh, public statements that uh, MacArthur was making and uh, another factor in that was that uh, Truman turned to the Joint Chiefs of Staff to get their advice about uh, uh, what they recommended should be done with a general in the field that was trying to make foreign policy uh, and making all these public statements and uh, they uh, unanimously agreed that uh, 
MacArthur was uh, upsetting the apple cart by making these public statements in defiance of uh, the commander-in-chief and they uh, strongly recommended that he be uh, removed because of his insubordination. The timing of the announcement of the relief is were you wonderfully catalog how the president uh, sent out the announcement at 1 a.m. in the morning. Well, the reason for that was that, uh, first of all, uh, President Truman <coughs> had enough compassion to uh, want MacArthur to, to uh, know about his decision prior to its uh, being made public to give MacArthur a chance to uh, brace himself. And, and so what President Truman did was to send his Secretary of the Army, Frank Pace, over to the Far East to uh, deliver this message to MacArthur that the President was going to uh, uh, relieve him of command. and. Uh, so uh, uh, <clears throat> Frank, P uh, Secretary of the Army Pace was in um, the Far East at the time uh, he was ordered to uh, deliver this personal message. And uh, he was actually out among the troops and they couldn't find him to uh, give him the latest instructions. And so uh, Pace uh, never did have a chance to meet personally with MacArthur. And uh, so uh, uh, while I was up at the Library of Congress uh, uh, researching this memorandum about McClellan, my Truman and his staff uh, early in the evening, uh, they had a staff meeting, and we always had a rule in the uh, Truman White House that uh, uh, he wanted the staff to come to a consensus of advice, but he said uh, to us, if any member of the staff believes that uh, the consensus uh, does not represent his belief why he's entitled to speak up. And uh, so during this discussion, I wasn't there, but I know about it from what others said, why uh, um, the assistant to Averill Harriman, a young man named Ted Tannenwald, uh, said, Mr. President, I think that you should uh, mention in your message to General MacArthur, that your action is being done with the unanimous recommendation of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And we had already rejected that and said that's not characteristic of what the President should do. But uh, Tannenwald renewed his suggestion because he wanted to take the political heat off of President Truman and make sure that. Uh, that everybody publicly understood that the Joint Chiefs of Staff unanimously agreed with his action. And at this point, uh, President Truman said to Tannenwald, uh, young man, that's a very good suggestion, but uh, this is a case where I, as Commander-in-Chief and President of the United States, uh, believe I should shoulder 100% of the responsibility and not try to shift the uh, responsibility to, to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And so uh, um, as the evening wore on, why uh, uh, the uh, White House Press Secretary, 
got a message uh, <clears throat> that a uh, reporter in Tokyo for the Chicago Tribune, which had an office in Tokyo, uh, had heard a rumor that um, <clears throat> there would be a important resignation uh, coming out of MacArthur's headquarters. And this rumor uh, came back to the press secretary of the White House, and pretty soon the uh, defense department began to also hear this rumor. And uh, since um, it came from two different sources, why uh, the press secretary, uh, named Joe Short, uh, reported this to the president. And uh, the uh, president was afraid that uh, in fact, he told the staff at this point, I was up at the Library of Congress, I didn't know about this, but I found out about it later, that uh, he said, uh, I'm not going to let him resign. I'm going to fire him. And so uh, <coughs> this was... Uh, as the evening wore on, why uh, finally uh, Truman said, that's what I'm really going to do. And finally, uh, about midnight, a report came back again from Tokyo saying that they had investigated this rumor and it was a false rumor. And at this point, uh, the press secretary uh, Joe Short uh, called the news conference and it took about an hour to uh, assemble the reporters after midnight and also to add a lot of telephone operators at the White House because they knew that switchboard would be jammed with calls and uh, finally at 1 a.m. the announcement was made and this was uh, <coughs> the reason for the delay although it, it sounded very suspicious and the uh, Republicans in Congress made a big issue of the fact that this decision was made uh, in the middle of the night, yeah. whereas the decision had been made early, earlier and only delayed because of this rumor, right. false rumor. Right. Oh, interesting, interesting. Um, Fast forward a little bit now to your become a congressman, 1957, you were elected, were you elected, was it 57 when you were elected? Well, let me give, give you the subsequent oh, development, sure. because uh, oh, yeah, sure. uh, subsequent development was that when MacArthur returned, uh, he gave a very triumphal speech to the Congress, repeating, there's no substitute for victory, and uh, it was said by the jokesters that uh, when MacArthur was speaking, there wasn't a dry eye among the Republicans and not a dry seat among the Democrats. <laughs> 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 because uh, they were all uh, very apprehensive about how this military hero was going to sweep the country and get elected president as a result of the ticker tape parades that he got all over the nation and he was a tremendous uh, military hero wherever he went from uh, <coughs> New York to San Francisco and uh, uh, he uh, really <coughs> looked like he was going to be elected to pres be president uh, except in 1952 when he 
became the <coughs> the keynote speaker at the Republican National Convention. The Republicans thought that he'd make a great president, but then <coughs> his high hopes were shot down during the primary in Wisconsin where he did very poorly and one of the reasons that eventually he did poorly politically was <clears throat> right after his speech in Congress uh, the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the <clears throat> Senate Armed Services Committee held a joint hearing that lasted uh, for several weeks in which they reviewed MacArthur's proposals. Uh, you know, the reason that uh, Truman objected to the use of our, uh, <coughs> of the forces on Taiwan was he was very much afraid that this would bring the Soviet Union into World War III and the, uh, <clears throat> one of the real mistakes that Truman made in June of 1950 was not to ask the Congress for a resolution of support. Uh, it was almost akin to the way in which second George Bush uh, went into Iraq uh, uh, without asking Congress and uh, so uh, as a result of that, the people and leaders in Congress who were very supportive of Truman's action to <coughs> resist the North Korean invasion with American troops, uh, if, if he had asked for a resolution of support, uh, that political action would have been blunted uh, but um, now you uh, mentioned uh, at this point you... Well, I'm going to fast forward a little bit here. In 1957, you get elected right. to Congress. Right. Uh, in 1958, actually, I was elected. 50, okay. 1957, I moved to West Virginia. Oh, that's it. Moved to West Virginia in 58. At one point, I've seen the pictures of uh, Senator Kennedy in West Virginia yes. uh, during the West Virginia primaries and I saw your picture and Senator Byrd's picture in the background of Kennedy and wasn't it in West Virginia where he first started to talk about the Catholic question? Well, um, <clears throat> um, there was a head of a printing plant in Parkersburg, West Virginia, named Robert McDonough, who was a member of the Wood County uh, uh, Executive Committee, who had graduated from Harvard. He was a Catholic, and he was very enamored with John F. Kennedy as a possible future president and uh, he invited Senator Kennedy to come to West Virginia. I specifically remember a luncheon meeting where 300 roaring Democrats uh, listened to uh, Kennedy speak and uh, I sat next to uh, a very young Ted Kennedy at the head table of that luncheon and uh, uh, Kennedy had already decided that uh, since West Virginia had a primary that that would be a very key state and uh, <clears throat> so uh, he spent considerable time in West Virginia in advance of 1960 and uh, he commissioned a poll uh, to ascertain how he stood politically in West Virginia if 
he were to run against uh, Hubert Humphrey, who also wanted to run for president in 1960. And uh, the polls showed that he would defeat Senator Humphrey by a margin of 70% to 30%. And this encouraged him further in 1960 to enter the uh, primary. And uh, uh, not too long after he entered the primary, why, uh, he took another poll, which showed that he was going to lose. And he went to McDonough and he said, uh, how come this reversal? And McDonough said, very clear, they discovered that you're a Catholic. <laughs> they didn't know that earlier. Uh, they really had not uh, <laughs> entered that into their thinking. And uh, so at this point, uh, Kennedy used to refer to McDonough as our man in Cuba. <laughs> Meaning that uh, West Virginia was uh, a questionable area, and uh, so um, I don't have a copy with me, but uh, in the spring of 1958, the same year I ran for the House of Representatives, I had developed a close friendship with Hubert Humphrey we were both political scientists, and he was very active in the American Political Science Association, where I had worked uh, in the 1950s. And so Humphrey wrote me a amazing letter in the, when I was competing in the primary of 1958. Uh, I had two Democratic opponents. And Humphrey violated all rules of protocol by writing me a letter publicly endorsing me in the primary, which is most unusual for a person out of state who usually would uh, wait until the primary was over before indicating a preference. But Humphrey went all overboard and wrote this letter saying that uh, uh, I would, uh, I was such a good candidate because I knew all about Congress, I had been teaching about Congress, and uh, I could hit the ground running if I were elected, and I wouldn't require any orientation. And it was a beautiful letter which I used to great effect to get the nomination in 1958. And so, in 1960, both Kennedy and Humphrey filed uh, in the West Virginia primary, and quite naturally, Humphrey came to me and he said, uh, look, I stuck my neck out to uh, help you in 1958. Now, uh, turnabout is fair play, can you help me? And I said, Hubert, uh, I think both you and John F. Kennedy will would make great presidents, and I really honestly must tell you that I can't publicly choose between you publicly. And uh, I said, I'd be glad to help both you and Kennedy with any research material you need, anything about the uh, strengths and weaknesses of the parties in various sections of West Virginia. And I would also be very pleased personally to, if you want me to introduce you at any place, uh, but I can't uh, in good conscience uh, uh, support either one of you publicly. And uh, so, uh, Kennedy came to... Uh, and Humphrey understood that. What? And Humphrey understood that? He accepted it? He that. accepted it. I, I didn't say he understood it. He accepted <laughs> it. 
I understand the difference. I mean, he knew enough about me that when I made up my mind that I, I wouldn't change it. And uh, he, he accepted it. And, uh, and of course, uh, Kennedy and his people kept working on me. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, Hubert came to West Virginia uh, with very little money. He had spent all his money in a primary in Wisconsin that preceded the mm -hmm. West Virginia primary. And uh, he also uh, uh, did not have the same financial advantages that Kennedy had a private plane called the Caroline that could go from one end of the state to the other very quickly, whereas Humphrey had to depend on a bus. And uh, Kennedy had, you're familiar with HMS Pinafore, the song, The Sisters and the Cousins and the Ants, and the Sisters and the Cousins and the Ants of, of Kennedy included Bob Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, Sergeant Shriver, the brother-in-law, uh, and uh, the wives of the Kennedys were uh, uh, outstanding political figures also, and all those people. Uh, uh, I think the day that I recognized that Kennedy was going to win occurred when uh, I attended a rally for Kennedy down in Beckley and Raleigh County, West Virginia, and he said to me after the rally, he said, uh, I have an extra seat on my private plane going back to Washington. Would you like to ride with me? And of course, naturally, I agreed. And then he said, we're going to have a little meeting in the airport, a little strategy meeting in the conference room at the airport in Beckley. And uh, he said, uh, you're free to attend. There won't be anything that we want to keep secret from you. He said, the meeting is scheduled for 8 p.m. And as the clock was striking 8, and one door came Ted Kennedy, and another door Robert, and another door Sergeant Schreiber, and, and all members of the family. Uh, they had been in different sections of West Virginia, and without even saying hello, even though they hadn't seen each other, why, they sat down and said, here's what we need in Martinsburg, here's what we need in Wheeling, here's what we need in Bluefield, here's what we need in Huntington. And uh, the meeting just went click, 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 click. Uh, it was so well organized uh, that it was a marvel of, uh, of collaboration. And you know enough about political campaigns to know that uh, frequently the staff of a, in a campaign, the members of the staff were trying to muscle their way forward to show a, somebody who has, has a better idea than one of the other members of the staff, whereas here you had Kennedy's family, uh, which they all trusted each other, and Kennedy trusted members of his family. Uh, they didn't ever have to push forward to see who was better than another one, which was a tremendous advantage which uh, they had over Hubert Humphrey's staff, where there was the usual tension between members of the staff. And uh, so uh, the next night, I was with Hubert Humphrey in the town of Madison, the county seat of Boone County, West Virginia. And uh, as we were going up the elevator to the ballroom where Humphrey was to speak, Humphrey turned to his number one assistant, 
Bob Barry. And in a very plenty voice, he asked, uh, Bob, do we have a table for our literature up there? And I thought to myself, by golly, uh, here is the candidate trying to figure a minor detail of whether or not there's a table for literature, which apparently had not occurred at a previous meeting. In contrast to the uh, well-oiled organization of uh, the Kennedy staff, and I knew right then that Kennedy was going to win, which indeed he did, uh, and uh, that was a real eye-opener politically. Mm -hmm. Anything else about the 60 primary you want to know about? What should I ask about the 60 primary? What? Anything specific that I'm missing here that would be of, of interest? Uh, otherwise, I want to ask a question. You were down yesterday and pointed to Brown versus Board of Education yes. on the board. And you talked a little bit about kind of... Oh. This is Board of Education. Yes. And uh, you were referring to Harry Truman's, really, uh, the the way in which they integrated the armed forces through an yes. executive order. Yes. Talk a little bit about that, because you had used the baseball analogy as to how that all Yes, well, uh, uh, <clears throat> President Truman, as you know, was the first president to address the NAACP in 1947, and he also, um, immediately after the 1946 election, when he suffered a stinging defeat at the uh, midterm election, you know the circumstances of that, of course, which uh, the Republicans said, had enough vote Republican, everybody after a major war as they were in 1920 uh, wants to do away with all these wartime controls and as Warren Harding said, get back to normalcy. And uh, so this was probably the most fortunate thing that ever happened to Truman because it meant that he had a Republican Congress that enabled him to uh, blame them for all the shortcomings that the Republicans were trying to blame him, and he was able strategically to shift the blame to the Congress. And, uh, the Republican Congress, uh, except in the areas of foreign policy, was really very backward. And uh, as you probably know, uh, the greatest speech that Truman ever made politically was accepting the nomination at the 48 convention because in Philadelphia three weeks earlier the Republicans had come out with this very liberal platform that called for expansion of Social Security and uh, attention to aid to education and civil rights and so Truman uh, very uh, carefully quoted this in his speech and said, now, these are wonderful goals that the Republicans have advocated. I'm going to give them a chance to put them into practice by calling the Congress back into special session <laughs> on July 26, which in Missouri is called Turnip Day. And he said, on the there's a saying in Missouri on the 26th of July, plant your turnips, wet or dry. And uh, it, it sort of popularized the whole idea of, uh, it brought it down to earth where it made it very attractive to people to watch this. And this uh, caused people to flock to Truman's support. But, uh, Go ahead if you want well, me. Well, you're talking about that. Uh, you, you mentioned the reference to Tinker's to Evers to Chance. Oh, yes. Well, this is the most famous double play in history. The old Chicago Cubs, Tinker to Evers to Chance. So what Truman did was to appoint Todd Clark as the uh, 
attorney general. And uh, so when he smelled an issue coming up, he would call Tom Clark and ask him to prepare an amicus brief for Chief Justice Vincent, whom we had appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. And uh, then Vincent would take this amicus brief uh, word for word and work it into a unanimous decision on issues like uh, uh, transportation, education, and uh, finally, uh, uh, while Vincent was still alive as Chief Justice, uh, they had actually presented the case, uh, 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 and uh, Warren simply uh, picked up what had been presented to Vincent, and the uh, the double play was. Truman to Clark to Vincent, yep. <laughs> uh, which was 100% uh, effective because it was all there in black and white from the amicus brief. Yeah, yeah. And this was uh, the wonderful background of Brown versus Board of Education. That's terrific. I love it. And I love you, by the way. This has been unbelievably terrific to have you in our presence, and it's so exciting to see as you embark at age 95 on running for United States Senate. So congratulations, Ken Heck. <laughs> well, uh, you were an inspire, uh, inspiring uh, uh, questioner, so uh, you bring out the best in me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a lot to bring out, and I'm honored to you at Chautauqua, and we hope it's not the last time you've been here. You know, uh, the year 2010, as you know, has been very good to me. It started out in January with my being named uh, uh, to the top state winner of the Martin Luther King Achievement Award by the Black Culture Office at WVU. And then April 29, I go to uh, Berea College to receive the Berea College Service Award. And then this wonderful thing that happened uh, up at the Kennedy Library, without my knowledge, uh, 